Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, good evening and welcome for the 2022 Champions for Mental Health Awards. Yes, go ahead, yeah. Okay. My name is Jim Doremus and I'm the chair of the Board of Directors for Riverbend. I joined the board five years ago and originally thought my involvement would be short term but I quickly became impressed with the dedication, commitment, and skill level of the staff and the board, and, th and now consider it a privilege to be connected with and serve this amazing organization. One of those board members that I serve with is our honoree, Lucy, Lucy Hodder. Lucy was originally elected to the board in 2006 and re-elected in 2009. She resigned in January of 2013 due to a new position at the governor's office, uh, which you will learn about later in the program. She was reelected to the board in 2015 and remained for two terms until ending in June 2021. While on the board, Lucy served on the executive committee and the Capital Regional Health Care Board. And Lucy, there, there we are. And Lucy, um, while we miss you on the board, and we really do, we're grateful that you're uh, that since you've termed off, we're in a position where we can finally recognize you for all the good work that you've done for Riverbend. So thank you. Okay. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Uh, you can find the full listing on the back of our program. And please do, please try to support these folks. They do a, an awful lot to support Riverbend. And at this time, I would like to welcome on the stage our presenting sponsors to share a few thoughts. Um, thank you so much. You know, my name is Kate Scuteris, and I run the New Hampshire um, market for Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. Um, and there's, you know, this is a really special moment for me given my background. Lucy and I worked together. Um, we were both in state government together, championing for um, the Medicaid enhancement tax. I know, I know. But it was important for New Hampshire. Um, and also, I worked with Lisa on the provider side, and really, she is phenomenal in the behavioral health space. So Riverbend is really lucky to have her. But tonight I'm really honored to be here on behalf of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. We're a local nonprofit health plan in New Hampshire. And because we're a nonprofit, we have a mission. And really that's to build and support healthy communities. And we do that by supporting other nonprofits. And Riverbend is such a tremendous organization with a mission of improving the health and well-being of our community and that's right in keeping um, with what we you know, want to do. So we've been through this pandemic. Behavioral health is more important than ever. At Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, we've always believed in connecting the mind and body and making sure that our members get a whole health experience. Um, and we couldn't do that with tremendous partners like Riverbend. So honored to be here tonight. Really excited um, for the program and thank you. Thank you for having us. You all look wonderful, by the way. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is John Broderick, and I'm here tonight on behalf of uh, Dartmouth Health, and honored to be here for any event that Riverbend hosts and that honors someone like Lucy Hodder. Uh, I spent the last six and a half years of my life traveling all around New England visiting hundreds of schools talking about mental health issues and mental health awareness. And Riverbend, which is a staple in this community, Peter Evers and now Lisa, uh, is so important to the lifeblood of this community. And Lucy Hodder, I've known Lucy for a long time. Uh, it's hard not to know who she is, but I think I, I've been privileged to know her a little better than just reading about her. And uh, she's an amazing human being, by the way. Uh, I've, I've made some bad decisions in my life, some of them while I was a judge, but I don't acknowledge that. <laughs> but just the other day, I got a call from Bill Belichick, and I said, oh, play both quarterbacks. Who's going to complain? <laughs> <laughs> but one decision I did make that I'm very proud of, and that is when I was dean of the law school, Lucy Hodder, 
I asked her to come by one day and talk to me and asked her if she had an interest in joining the faculty. Not that I could make it happen all by myself, but I did make the recommendation and she's been one of the most important additions to that faculty in my time in New Hampshire. And when it comes to health law and mental health integration into health law, uh, she leads the pack. So congratulations to Lucy, congratulations to Riverbend, and it's a genuine honor to be here tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Kate, and thank you, John. Appreciate that. Um, unfortunately, folks, you've heard Lisa Madden mentioned. Lisa's our president and CEO extraordinaire, um, but she's under the weather, unfortunately, and can't be with us this evening. But stepping in for Lisa, uh, on Lisa's behalf, is someone who's almost as extraordinary, and that's John, John Bartholomew. And John is the immediate past chair of the Riverbend Board, and has previously served as the Riverbend Interim CEO. Please join me in welcoming John. Wow, what a great evening. Lucy, uh, you really bring in the crowd, I'll tell you. Really good night. Um, but Lisa sends her best. I spoke to her this afternoon, um, and she is definitely, it's good for her that she's not here, and it's good for us that she's not here either. It's just, <laughs> it's, um, but she does send her best. And she um, asked that I highlight Lucy's work as in public policy as an advocate, and her focus on improving access to behavioral health in New Hampshire uh, during this critical time. You'll hear more about Lucy's work in a minute, but I briefly mention, want to mention two areas uh, that Lisa thinks are very important where Lucy's been front and center. The first is on healthcare parity, uh, which is critical to the future of the community mental health centers. Lucy has demonstrated strong support for treating the patient as a whole person. Understanding mental health is essentially essential to overall health. Support for equal payment for mental health professionals so Riverbend can recruit and retain these individuals. And she did this while providing guidance support all along the way, assisting the development of innovative programs to meet our patients' needs. The other area that Lucy has been front and center on is telehealth. Thanks to her advocacy, telehealth, both phone and video, has become a modality of treatment for those living with mental health and addiction. What that means is those citizens, patients, that have need childcare, transportation, work obligations, and some that just may feel more comfortable doing it over telehealth. Um, it takes down barriers so they can get access to the quality treatment that they need. On a personal note, Lucy, um, I, we did work together in Riverbend, but we first met when you were the legal counsel for then Governor Maggie Hassan. Um, and one of the, you had health care as one of your assignments, and I'm sure other people will be talking about it. But my memory is that you were tasked with um, getting Medicaid expansion moving through the legislature. And I was there, and it was not an easy task. I remember being in a number of meetings with Lucy, and some of the opposition, and trust me, there was opposition, uh, you heard things like, it's too much money, we don't need it. It's Obamacare. I don't need to know about Obamacare. I don't want anything to do with it. Am I right, Lucy? Um, but what I saw was I, I saw a woman who was in, very intelligent, had great communication skills, was a good listener, and she took the time to deconstruct all the reasons why those arguments hold, did not hold water and that it was needed. Um, and I saw her change minds. I saw her change uh, the minds of a number of people. Um, and I believe that Lucy Harder, in her role in the governor's office, was a key instrument for us now having Medicaid expansion. And by the way, at the time, we were seeing a ramp up of drug overdose deaths. We were seeing an epidemic of addiction and untreated mental health, and Lucy Harder um, played an integral part in making sure that people that up until that point had not have uh, mental health care and health care in general 
we're now receiving that. So, Lucy, on behalf of Lisa Madden, Riverbend community, I thank you for all you've done with those living with the challenges of mental health. Don't go away, please. We need your guidance, your wisdom, and your continued support. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you. And at this time now, uh, we would like to share with you our tribute to Lucy. Are you ready, Lucy? Okay. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you to Riverbend Community Mental Health Center for inviting me to join you for the 16th Annual Champions of Mental Health Awards this evening in Concord. I am so pleased to share my warmest congratulations and best wishes with my dear friend, Lucy Hodder, who's being honored tonight with this year's Champion in Mental Health Award. We all know how committed Lucy has been throughout her career to healthcare access, equity, and affordability, including championing integrated health as a system of care to join treatment of physical and mental health, as well as substance use disorder. I have known Lucy throughout her career in practicing healthcare law and policy during our time together as colleagues at Rath Young and Pignatelli. As chair of our firm's healthcare practice group, she was a trusted advisor to providers and businesses on the ever-changing healthcare regulatory environment. And now, as the director of health law and policy programs at University of New Hampshire's Franklin Pierce School of Law and Institute for Health Policy and Practice, Lucy continues to be a leading and respected voice on mental health care. Thank you as well to Riverbend Community Mental Health for hosting this annual event and for all that Riverbend does in our Concord and Central New Hampshire communities to support our friends and family in need of specialized behavioral health services. Congratulations, Lucy. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Hello, I'm Senator Maggie Hassan. I'm sorry I couldn't join you in person but thank you for inviting me to address Riverbend's 16th Annual Champions for Mental Health Awards. Riverbend does vital work, providing resources to those who are struggling with mental health challenges, bringing communities together to help support our fellow Granite Staters in need. Your work is bolstered by leaders in our communities who are committed to making a difference, including my friend Lucy Hodder, who's being honored tonight Throughout her career, Lucy has exemplified what it means to be a champion for mental health. As my legal counsel in the governor's office, Lucy played an instrumental role in helping develop and pass into law New Hampshire's bipartisan Medicaid expansion plan, which provided access to health care for tens of thousands of Granite Staters, including by expanding treatment for substance use disorder and mental health services. Beyond her time in the governor's office, Lucy has continued to serve our communities through her work at the University of New Hampshire and at various nonprofits, devoting her time and energy to building a stronger, more accessible healthcare system where people can get the mental health supports that they need. Lucy, thank you for your invaluable contributions to strengthening mental health care in New Hampshire. There's no doubt that people in our state are better off because of your dedicated and skillful efforts. I am grateful for all of your work and congratulations on this incredibly well-deserved honor. Thank you again to Riverbend for hosting this event. Be safe, everybody. Lucy is an amazing person and has had a profound impact on uh, mental health and addiction uh, services at both the macro level, the systems level, and at the micro level, on the individual level. Doing social policy and at the micro end in terms of inspiring and teaching a whole future generation of potential leaders who are knowledgeable and invested in social health policy. 
the Affordable Care Act and Medicare expansion is meaningless if there's not culture change and accountability that goes with it. And Lucy has had the knowledge and the understanding to drive the accountability that's needed to change those systems so that things like the essential health benefits that were required in the Affordable Care Act and in Medicaid expansion and pre-existing conditions are put into place and enforced and those long-standing practices which discriminated against people with mental illness um, are done away with over time. We had the worst mental health and developmental disabilities services in the country. If not, the we, there were many tied for worst, but we were, we were right in that group. Lucy helped us craft policy and practice that would ultimately become so critically important for each problem as, as those things systematically were being improved upon. It was always Lucy who was there as the partner leading the way from the place most in need, listening to and being part of the domestic violence programs, the women's health programs, etc. And it, it just one after another allowed us to keep taking that next step and next step till our ultimately our mental health systems became some of the best around and were being done at kind of the middle point of pricing so that we weren't making the serious mistakes and running the multiple systems of care. We had targeted, partnered programs and that was Lucy all the way. She was really instrumental in evaluating you know, how, how when mergers occur throughout the state, how is that going to impact those who are receiving mental health services and behavioral health services? Will that merger result in good outcomes for the patient or, or not? And so she's done a lot of research um, and given us a lot as a department, given us a lot of really great feedback as to, you know, what we can do to ensure that those services are still accessible, even when there are um, changes in just the structure, changes in providers, and obviously these mergers. Lucy will always do what she thinks is right for others, and she won't give up. She's involved in every single aspect. She has everything in mind from the funding and sustainability to making sure the right people are at the table in terms of advocacy. And she's taking all of that and really trying to push this system. It's not just that she is vocal about what is important. It's that she puts action into place. She seeks out the work that needs to be done. She gets the right people together. And so every meeting, she comes ready to go. She's ready to have those tough conversations. She's strategizing. She can think big, but she can also think how the end user is going to experience this. The, her mind is brilliant. <laughs> it really is. And we are so fortunate to have her in New Hampshire. But the project that I will always remember is when she said yes when I asked her if she would please come to the Institute. Between the law school and the Institute for Health Policy at the College of Health and Human Services, we could build a health law program that would train people, not just about the legal aspects about it, but about the whole healthcare system. And who better to be able to unravel that and open that to education than Lucy. She's just done a fabulous job. The health policy program here at the law school um, has been a really important pro part of our program overall for seven years or so. In recent years, we have seen interest in that program grow and expand, and Lucy Hodder has been a huge part of that growth. You know, as we think about some of the grand challenges we face as a society today, Healthcare is really at the core of many issues that, that we face. And, and so Lucy has really been able to build the program by working directly with students, um, by personally teaching classes, by bringing in sort of experts from all over the place to contribute to our program. I was um, introduced to Professor Hodder. Uh, originally in my second year of law school, I took a health law course from her. And from that moment on, I was just really interested in health law. She made it so engaging and she was so passionate um, about it that I ended up taking more courses from her and getting a health law certificate. I have lived experience um, watching my mother deal with her multiple chronic conditions, some of them mental related. It's that personal motivation that wants me to advocate for others who deal with the same sort of barriers that she does. Healthcare costs are too high and for those who deal with mental health challenges, 
I frankly believe it's unfair that they have to interact with the healthcare system where sometimes they are left with the choice of, uh, do I want to help myself? Hopefully, as I pursue my legal career, I can help address that issue and bring these costs down so everyone can have access to um, health care if they need it. The law school is very stressful. It is really tough. Um, but the law school does a great job of providing wellness courses. I remember being educated each week on different issues that might come up and how we can address them. Um, so it didn't feel like we were alone and the professors felt really approachable and Lucy was one of those professors that was easy to approach and more than willing to help students out. We have a student-led organization called Mental Health Alliance, um, and already they've had a few events, um, including inviting Chief Justice John Broderick to talk about his career path while also dealing with a son who manages mental illness. And I think that was probably very illuminating for a lot of students. What's so beneficial about the drop-in program is how hectic student schedules are, so it's hard to take time out of your schedule and your week to um, work on your mental health so it's good that someone didn't have to plan like out like okay at this time every week so instead it's just like okay I can take this moment and I have a free time to just drop in. The student run program has been very beneficial to students because they don't feel as alone with their stressors in law school so they have community. We've worked with Riverbend to, you know, on a partnership where we bring a counselor in, um, you know, once or twice a week to help talk with students and make that resource available to our students wherever they are. We have a growing population of students that are not resident in New Hampshire, but they're participating in our hybrid JD program, which is a, a mostly online JD. Um, and those students are located in you know, 38 states across the country. So it's been a challenge to kind of meet those students where they are, both kind of you know, mentally and, and geographically. And so we've been able to provide remote resources to, to these students through Riverbend, which has been an incredible partnership for us. We're also really proud to house the Institute for Health Policy and Practice here at the law school. So they're very you know, much a, a practical part of our, our daily lives and of, of the law school. It's so hard to think of one word to describe Lucy because I would say brilliant, passionate, um, effective. How about three words? Lucy, tenacious. Tenacious. <laughs> if I were to describe Lucy in one word, it would be tenacious. Determined. She has a million things going on. Always makes a point to get it done, always makes a point to, to address us at the, at the same time. And I know balancing all those plates at the same time, um, uh, for me, it'd be difficult. Uh, and for her, it seems effortless. She's a total force. She's a powerhouse. She knows what needs to happen. She is listening to people who have the best ideas. I think she is creative and strategic and passionate and caring. And she has been dedicated to these issues for a very long time. And Lucy really exemplifies, she doesn't just talk the talk, she walks the walk. She really is a champion for mental health, both as a professor, but after law school, her mentorship and her advisement, even for the medical legal partnership, has really advanced how the legal system is able to help people with mental health issues and substance use disorders. She, I mean, she's fantastic. I, I don't know how else to say it. She's just great. I don't want to stand in Lucy's way. I, I, and I definitely don't want her litigating against me. The thing about Lucy is she is always one step ahead. You know, I would not presume to tell Lucy what's needed next. I would say, Lucy, what do you need us to be doing next? One of the things that I think is really important is how she does it, the attributes that she has. She does three things that stand out to me. Number one, she challenges us with her ideas and forces us to think about the ideas. We can get caught up in the problems we face, but she drives us to try and find that idea that might help. And the second thing is, she's able to take the strands of those ideas and weave them in, into a mosaic, a, a fabric, if you will, which gives us a vision. So we go from the ideas that we have to a vision of the future we can create together. And she does that weaving so well. And then finally, what I think she does is, is frankly, she gives us hope that together 
together we can do this job. We can solve that problem that vexes us. And while coming up with ideas and creating a vision and giving us hope are, are attributes, what I really think is, in Lucy's case, they're gifts. Um, they're gifts that she gives us. They're gifts that allow us to be better personally, our, our organizations to do more and be better, for our community to be greater, and frankly, for our state to move forward. And for that, um, we're here tonight because we're grateful. And we just want to say thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Very early on, realized that making change, uh, especially making change to give people more voice was something I really wanted to do. I was victim of a, a crime when I was a, a young girl and just really brought out this desire to be able to recognize vulnerabilities and um, make change to make sure that we recognize what everyone's going through and bring them to their best self. There's no end to what can be done and needs to be done. I mean, we're still talking about stigma. We're still talking about the disparity in payment and service. We're still talking about lack of resources and places for people go to get well. And that's after decades of so many people working together. Receiving this award sort of means everything to me. I have witnessed what mental illness does to people and the, the cloud it can bring over their lives, which, um, you know, I was helpless to blow away and I feel like this award, having, having spent years working with people who are committed to helping others get better, that I could have had something to do um, with that journey and those successes means the absolute world to me. Um, there's nothing I think is more important and nothing that's influenced me more than seeing the people I love suffer. done for Riverbend, for the state of New Hampshire. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So much. Thank you, everybody. It is just such, such an honor to have you all here. And thank you, John, so much. The former commissioner of safety, by the way, um, which he failed to let everyone know. Um, and Lisa in absentia, um, and Jim, and everyone at Riverbend um, who is here, who has been here for leading an incredible organization. And um, for your remarks tonight, I'm really absolutely overwhelmed. Um, Karen, where are you? Karen Jansen and her team who helped organize this great event for us to celebrate. <laughs> And, Car and Carol Sobelson, who nominated me and is an amazing provider in her own right. And for the many Riverbend board members that I have served with over the years and I've worked with, and especially some of the Riverbend staff who I still get to work with at IHPP, um, just incredible. My journey with Riverbend and mental health policy has been deep and long. Um, I think back to Dale Klatsker, um, and Riverbend has such a unique and important place in our community as part of Capital Region Healthcare. They're in our schools, in our emergency rooms, in our lives, and the need and the commitment of Riverbend is just innovative and unending. There's almost nothing they don't take on when there is a need, and they can um, fill that gap. Um, and you saw what they're doing at the law school for our students, just an incredible celebration. So I'm just, I'm mostly overwhelmed to see all of you um, celebrating 30 years of working together um, to make New Hampshire's 
system of mental health care better through lean and mean times um, and through hopeful times as well. I'm particularly overwhelmed to be joined by all of you who live with mental illness. Um, thank you for standing up and being here today. And all of you who love friends and family who live with mental illness, that's probably all of us, um, or who have lost someone to mental illness or substance use. So many of you care for people with mental illness as professionals and as caregivers. And there are even some of you who are training to be mental health professionals, so incredibly proud of you. For the policymakers and um, legislators uh, and advocates, big and small, who seek to make change every day. Um, I love seeing my family and friends from near and far, even from fourth grade. Thank you for coming. Um, and my colleagues from Rath, Young, and Pignatelli and the New Hampshire Bar. Um, I, you know, they're my family of origin. Um, and UNH and the Institute for Health Policy and Practice, incredible leaders, incredible teams um, with such a dedicated staff um, who do so much change. Uh, State of New Hampshire people who every day, whether they're thanked or not, um, often uh, with barbs coming at them, who push on to make change in our policy. And thank you to my students um, and my friends from the law school. Um, you all inspire me and you are out there um, making change and doing amazing things. There's nothing I feel better about than educating you and helping to give you the tools to be good lawyers and change what you see is wrong um, and uh, make policy in the future. So I wanna talk for a minute, cause I get to be up here. Um, you all did this. Um, I wanna talk about mental illness and I wanna call it by its name. And I wanna talk about substance use and I want to call it by its name. And let's name it without shame. Let's name it with love and with understanding and with patience. We cherish in this room the health of our minds as readily as we cherish the health of our bodies. Yet, yet still in our society, in our systems, in our healthcare industry, we do not and cannot all the time do the same. For a society that loves brilliance and smarts and innovation, you would think that the top of our list always would be our mental health. Not after it's tried to destroy us from within, but before. So why is it so hard to give it a name? Say the words to yourself, speak the words, my loved one lives with depression. We all remember when we first met mental illness, a disease that can take over quickly or can creep in slowly. I remember one vivid day realizing that I could see the person I loved, but she could not see me. I could speak to him, but he could not hear me. I could feel them enveloped in a big, scary, unfamiliar cloud. Yet somehow I didn't have the words and no one could give me the name for what was happening. Why, without a name, can there be recognition? Can there be care? Um, I am so lucky to have read Bishop Rob's book that he wrote about depression with sighs too deep for words because he describes it for us. And Bishop Rob, I know you have said I can do this to you. Um, he calls it the mysterious pain sitting within me, immovable and obstinate, a giant granite weight. He describes that no smile or metaphor successfully captures the whole of it. What feels like unyielding weight to one person may be a suffocating shadow to another. The worst periods of my struggle, he tells us, I can physically feel the psychological pain and a tingling of my scalp. Food loses its flavor. The prospect of any physical contact makes my skin crawl. Mental illness is physical. Rob suggests we must name it. 
We morally must name it. The failure of language, he says, to embody the truth of mental illness has led me, among others, to feelings of alienation, loneliness, and dismal failure. Well, Bishop, you are not alone, and you are not a dismal failure. Thank you for giving words to your mental illness. Without a name, we have no pathways. I remember being shocked that we did not have family words for mental illness. Shouldn't we collectively leave no stone unturned to help what is a mortal disease? Yet during my lifetime, here were some of the realities, and these realities are what have propelled me to be here tonight with all of you who have felt the same over time. Admitting to a mental illness could render you unemployable. In fact, until law students corrected the problem mental illness, history was a screening question on the bar application in New Hampshire and could be preclusive. Treatment and services have been segregated, hard to find. Health insurance for many years did not even cover services for substance use or mental illness. It's been a carved out benefit, a carved out system, somebody else's problem. Reimbursement for mental health and substance use remains minuscule and unsustainable. Medicines have been limited. The same innovation that we pour into other types of health care, we do not pour into mental illness or innovations for medications and other treatments. There are no fancy fountains. There are today unfair options for people in crisis. While we are trying to solve them, they are simply unfair. So why is mental and physical health somehow treated as disconnected and different parts of the same person? Despite the obvious and mortal impact of mental illness and substance use to our community's health, we simply don't invest in mental health on par with physical health. A Milliman report, because you know I'm going to be giving you statistics, right? <laughs> Published in late 2019, did a broad study and confirmed what we knew that people with mental illness have integrated health care needs. The deeper the mental illness, the worse the health conditions. The mind and body are inextricably intertwined. As they say, no duh. The same report looked at the total spending for these people, for people in commercial coverage and Medicaid and Medicare, people with mental illness or substance use. A tiny fraction of the spending on their health care was actually services to treat their mental illness or substance use disorder. So for the very high need patients with mental illness, where total health care spending was over $45,000 a year, over half of them had less than $99 spent on mental health treatment. What a head scratcher. Today, almost a third of our community in New Hampshire lives with mental illness or substance use disorder. And New Hampshire's rate of suicide deaths remains consistently higher than the national rate and the second leading cause of death amongst 10 to 34-year-olds. So let's give it a name. Let's talk about what we have done and what we can do together. Because I have hope when I look at all of you who are here and I think of all the things we have done together, I have hope. Positivity brings change. I've had the great privilege to work with caregivers and policymakers and legislators and lawyers and students and social workers and regulators, you all know who you are, innovating around care, defending and finding resources, I'm gonna say that a lot, defending and finding resources and opening doors for patients, I am a truly lucky lawyer. I've been invited into the most optimistic, mission-driven, kind, persevering group of mental health advocates in New Hampshire. In fact, I get to be in meetings with social workers, with nurses, with OT therapists. Just a half hour in a Zoom meeting with a social worker makes me better. It's my own therapy. Um, so here's to all the social workers in the room. Um, so how did I get here? 1993, um, with my husband, Rob. Uh, so he could do his primary care and GI training up at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Thank you, Dartmouth. Um, for sponsoring us and for all you do. 
I was thrown into the frying pan at the Attorney General's office, representing the Department of Health and Human Services and the Division of Mental Health and the State Hospital. And the first person I met as a client was, in fact, Don Shumway, um, who was the director at that time um, and then later became the commissioner. And John Wallace and the late Rye Perry trying to resource our community mental health system and Riverbend and the State Hospital to deinstitutionalize care in whatever way we could. We changed laws, resolved litigation, leveraged federal dollars, there they are again, to further enhance and entrench community care for the most vulnerable. Then in 98 through 2010 and beyond, healthcare innovation and change just pervaded the healthcare system. Um, mental health parity remained persistent and stubborn issue, an unachievable dream. And you heard that finally in 2014, we were able to work together to help bring mental health and substance use disorder treatment under all health insurance plans. Not till 2014 did we even have a substance use benefit in our Medicaid program. And then, since then, we have been working to entrench mental health and substance use services in our care delivery um, with coverage and affordability. And persistence and change with state partners and community partners, we've been searching, and I've watched all of you try and turn over every stone for every resource and idea to deal with this wicked problem, which is how to support mental health and the multifaceted opioid response reality. So I see here in the room teammates from our work um, at Riverbend, where they operate a doorway and we get to work with them to provide substance use crisis treatment to the community. Three chairs for your existence and your perseverance, Riverbend and the doorway. Such a pleasure working with you on that. And then as we've rolled out 988, so many of you in the room now are working diligently for the existing suicide hotline and the mobile rapid crisis response to transition it to the 988 number and to roll out a mobile response in New Hampshire so that we have someone to call, someone to respond, and hopefully somewhere to go now for people in crisis. There's so much that we've been able to do together. Um, telehealth, Children's Mental Health Services, Medicaid to Schools, Perinatal Task Force with the amazing work with moms and substance use at Concord Hospital and the Perinatal um, Task Force and people who founded that effort are here tonight. Um, we have really worked hard to get at some of these intractable issues. I'm so proud to be here with all of you. I've been so lucky to work with all of you to be at the law school, at the Institute for Health Policy and Practice, and to work with the state through all these twists and turns over the years. I do really hope for a day when we have a truly integrated and equal system of care for physical and mental health without stigma. Top of the fold, top of the line, bragging rights for how well we do it. When we show our commitment through words and deeds and dollars of investment. So you and I do not have to take yet another call from a family member who has a child in deep distress, but no place to go. It's all our responsibility. And I thank you all for the work that you do every day to change the system that we're in and make it better. And thank you Riverbend for paving the way positively with a sense of humor always seeking to help patients where they are with what they need. And thank you for my family, without whom I would not be here today. My parents are here. They came to New Hampshire, north of the border. That's a real effort. <laughs> um, and 30 years later, Rob and I are still here. In fact, I went into health policy, to be honest, because I thought if we have more people like Rob to treat others, we'll all be okay. I told them to come up if I started crying. <laughs> he is calm, patient, smart, and he has never, ever complained 
about getting beeped all night long, going into the hospital at any hour for any patient at any time on call. We're so lucky. And my children, Rebecca and Andrew, who are both here, who are my source of strength and fun and all things, um, who tell me every day as I'm ranting about something, get a therapist, mom. <laughs> I'm so honored to be amongst all the champions in this room, the champions who have been rewarded and are yet to be rewarded. Um, thank you for partnering with us and for our future together, making New Hampshire a better place. You know, Lucy, you said that you felt fortunate to be able to work with all these wonderful people, but I think we all feel pretty fortunate and very lucky to, a bit, to know you and to work with you and to appreciate all that you've done for, for our, our, our state. Thank you. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is uh, the, the formal part of our uh, presentation tonight, so I think there's still, I'm gathering, there's still some food and beverage left over, and we hope you can partake in that. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. <laughs>